Why? Why? I'm not a teenager. Why am I still with the zits? Why? Why? <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back in today's episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Excuse me, it's Crew Trime. If you are new here, my name is Sarah. Hi, hello. What I'm doing here is I'm telling a terrible story to ruin your day and putting my makeup on while I do it. Also, you're not going crazy. I said Crew Trime. The description box says Crew Trime. The title says Crew Trime. We're saying Crew Trime because that's what it is. It's Crew Trime. Um, it's true crime, but I batted the talkings. <laughs> and it just stuck. It's a tongue twister and it's silly and it just stuck. So here we are, crew time. It's crew time time. This is the story of Dennis Nilsson. This story, Dennis Nilsson, this is one of the most famous serial murder cases in Great Britain. So accordingly, there's lots of retellings of the story. There are lots and lots and lots of documentaries and books and articles and everything that you could ever want to read and know and learn about this case more than you probably even want to. There's also quite a few channels like this that have retold this story. So I will make sure to link those down in the description box, including one from Miss Queen Brittany Vaughn. We love her. You know, what's interesting to me about the story, even more so than the actual details of the story, which are crazy. When you watch the different retellings or documentaries or whatever about this story, each one kind of focuses on different parts of things that might be really important, like the psychological aspect or his background or the victims or, you know, the state of the economy in England at that time. It's all very interesting, so. Oh, by the way, I don't talk about the makeup when I'm putting it on, but if you're interested in anything that I'm using, just look down in the description box. Everything is linked. Let's get on with it. On Wednesday morning, February 8th, 1983, officers, police officers, were called to 23 Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, North London, to investigate suspicious debris found in a drain. Upon inspection and analysis, the debris was found to be human remains. In the course of the investigations, one of the tenants of the building was charged with murder. Mike Catran, a dino rod plumber, discovered the blockage of the pipes. Huge amounts of flesh and bone. I have a limited knowledge, but very heavily suspected that it wasn't some um, animal, shall we say. Human flesh, okay, and police were called. So, so the blockage of the pipe was traced to the upstairs apartment, flat if you like. And when police knocked on the door of that apartment, Dennis Nilsson answered. Now, when the door opened to that apartment. Oh, even Stink would say that stinks. The stench of just decay, death. Oh, it smells like carrots and throw up. Anyways, it about knocked out the investigators. Oh, I didn't wet my beauty blender. Oh, hold please. When Detective Chief Inspector Jay and Detective Inspector Steve McCusker arrived to question Dennis Nilsson, he was very cooperative. Like I said, they were hit with the intense stench of death. So when DCI Jay said to Dennis Nilsson, don't mess me about, okay, where are the bodies? Nilsson was like, well, shit. Yeah, they're in the cupboard over there. Like he told them everything. Dennis Nilsson led them right over to a cupboard that had two large garbage bags, rubbish bags, filled with body parts. They arrested him for murder of someone. At this point, it's pieces, not a person, you know? So the detectives had noticed that the bags were quite large and full, and there's no way that it was just one person. So when they were in the car with Dennis, Des, he went by Des. When they were in the car with him, they said, is there more than one body? What's going on? And Dennis Nelson very calmly said, yeah, there's probably like 14 or 15. <laughs> so let me just pause for a second here. There's a three part mini series from ITV called Des starring David Tennant as Dennis Nelson. David Tennant looks just like this guy. It's nuts crazy. You can watch it on Amazon Prime and some of the other streaming services, but it's incredibly well done. It, it feels like you're watching a documentary because it's just brilliant. 
That said, the family of one of um, Dennis Nilsson's victims has publicly denounced the series, saying that the series glorifies the murderer and they're making money out of people's misery, and I get it. I get it. Crew Triumph's not for everybody. People tell me every time I make a video how terrible it is. <laughs> You know, there's many people that find this whole thing to be macabre and exploitive and creepy and just icky. That's fine. There's actually a scene in the series where Dennis Nilsson is talking to Brian Masters, who um, was his biographer. Anyways, he's sitting down talking with Brian Masters about the upcoming trial and how upset he was that the press was gonna hear the explicit details about what happened to the victims in court. And Nilsson says to him, well, isn't that what you're doing? And Masters is like, me? I'm not exploiting these young men's tragedies to sell newspapers. And Nilsson says, yeah, you're just exploiting me. And the biographer is all like, what? Well, let me tell you. I will exploit a murderer all day. They deserve it, okay? And I don't feel bad about it. Fight me. Of course, it's never my intention to make fun of a victim. Anytime that I'm making jokes about anything, I'm making jokes at the expense of or about the criminal. Because they deserve it, okay? Fart sound? <laughs> You're getting a fart sound. Anyways. <laughs> okay, so, so who's Dennis Nilsson? I'm glad you asked. Dennis Andrew Nilsson, Des for short, was born on November 23rd, 1945 in Fraserburg, Aberdeenshire, Scotland, to Betty Duthie White and Olav Magnus Moksheem, who later changed his last name to Nilsson. He was, um, Swedish? Sweden? Norwegian? Anyways, the marriage between Olav and Betty was not good, surprise, surprise, and although they had three children, Olav was pr like absent and they ended up divorcing. So Betty and the children, Dennis and a brother and a sister, moved in with Betty's parents and Dennis grew quite close to his grandfather, Andrew. Andrew was a fisherman. They spent a lot of time together. It was pretty much Dennis's only friend. You know, he was kind of weird. When Des was five years old, about five years old, his grandfather suffered a heart attack and died. Now, his mother and grandmother didn't explain what really happened. He had just come home from school one day and his mother was crying in the kitchen and asked, do you want to see your grandfather? And Dennis is like, yeah, of course I do. But he was lying in a, like a coffin in the kitchen. They didn't explain to him at all what had happened. Also, he was too young to really understand any of that stuff. And they told Des that he was just sleeping. And that's what it looked like he was doing. You know, in those days, funeral wakes, the visitations of open caskets, they were held in the home. So it's not that weird. Kind of messed him up, you know, mentally. It took him months to realize that he was never coming back. He became very withdrawn and unhappy. And that really continued into his teen years. He later, kind of realized that he was gay or just, you know, not totally straight. Like he never really put a label on it. And in those days, that was just not socially acceptable. Des was a great student, very intelligent. Once he finished school, he joined the British army and he trained as a chef. He was deployed to the state of Aden in South Yemen. He served as a cook in the Al Mansura prison. This posting was fairly dangerous, you know? He had witnessed many of his fellow soldiers be killed. So it was during this deployment that Dez's sexual fantasies involving unresistant partners started to develop. Let me back it up a little bit. As Dez was growing up, he developed some pretty intense control issues and some very intense um, abandonment issues. It was always his goal to control things. He never wanted to be left behind, kind of the way his grandpa left him behind, I guess. If you watch Brittany Vaughn's retelling of this, she really gets into that detail, so I really recommend checking hers out. <laughs> now Des is in the army. He has these like fantasies about unresistant partners, death, dead things. Well, he had a private barracks room, so he really had kind of the privacy he needed to be able to explore these things. He used to strip down to his birthday suit. He would powder his whole body with like talcum powder, you know, so he would look pale and then he would just stare at himself in the mirror. After serving 11 years in the British Army, Des left service to join the Metropolitan Police and he relocated to London. I'm really like leaving out quite a lot of detail, but his relationship with his family wasn't great. They inferred that he was gay and did not approve. 
So things were strained there and there was kind of no love lost either. So he just left Scotland, moved to London. So now he's a junior constable in London, but it's not really a good fit, you know. He missed the army, he was drinking a lot, and he was quite unhappy with his romantic life, you know. By now it's the early to mid 1970s, so living as an out gay man wasn't nearly as taboo as it was in his early youth. Heh. <laughs> Did I mention that I'm using eyebrow stencils now? It's the best. So now that Des is in London, he's a, you know, approaching 30. But like I said, it wasn't really a great fit for him. He wasn't really enjoying it. He didn't, he didn't do it for very long. He resigned after less than a year. After he resigned, he took some random jobs doing like security work. But then he finally found a position doing like a, a civil servant job at a job center, which is like an unemployment agency. Okay, so in November 1975, Des made a new friend. He had been out and about in London's West End and he happened upon a young 20 year old man named David Galishin. He actually was kind of being harassed by some other larger men <laughs> outside of a pub. David had a very slight build. He was very petite for a man. Anyway, so after Des helped him out, the two men kind of hung out for the evening and they hit it off. Now, the nature of their relationship kind of varies depending on who's telling the story, I guess. Was it romantic? Was it not romantic? It's probably romantic, I don't know. Well, it ended up with Des inviting David to move in with him. No, they weren't really ever in an exclusive relationship, like an expressly boyfriend-boyfriend relationship, but probably like friends with benefits. Anyways, they still each brought home romantic liaisons. <laughs> the two of them had moved into a ground floor flat at 195 Melrose Avenue in the Cricklewood district of North London. And although their relationship was casual, it started to become strained. David wasn't really working as hard as Des thought he should. You know, Des had a full-time job outside of the home and David was just sort of home fixing the place up. I think at first it was working because Des enjoyed being in control, you know, being in charge, being the breadwinner or whatever, but they weren't like really, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. They were arguing, it wasn't working out, David had enough. He split. So by now it's May of 1977 and Des is alone with just his thoughts and his booze. And he's believing that he's just unlovable and he was depressed and desperate, despondent. On December 30th, 1978, Des was at the Cricklewood Arms pub and he saw a young man. He believed this young man to be like at least 18, but come to find out he was 14. Stephen Dean Holmes, the bar was turning him away and Des invited him back to his home saying, hey, I've got plenty of alcohol at my house. Come on over, my guy. So back at Des's apartment, they drank their faces off and passed out. Now here's the little nugget though. Des would drink and become drunk, but he would never get to the point where he wasn't in control anymore. But he would pretend that he was. So the other person would feel at ease or feel I don't know, just be a little bit more willing to indulge in that way. So he brought home this guy, they're drunk. He's got somebody there in his house with him now. He's got company. But in the morning, Des became overwhelmed with grief at the thought of being left again by another person. You know, that, guy, that kid wasn't gonna stay there forever. But Des didn't wanna be alone anymore. So he decided that Stephen was never leaving. So he strangled him with a necktie and then held his head down inside a bucket of water to drown him. That wasn't it, okay? This is where it starts to get real weird. So with Steven dead in his apartment, this is where Dez is now, now it's quality time. So he bathed him, powdered him, put makeup on him, laid him down in the bed, snuggled with him, and then he would do things to himself. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't necessarily do things to the bodies, not all the time, but he would definitely enjoy their company. Okay, well, we all know that once a person dies, you stiffen up, right? Rigor mortis sets in. That starts to wear off after a few hours, and once he was a little bit more pliable, Des pulled up the floorboards, put Stephen's body under the floorboards, and like just stored him there. But then like a week goes by, and he starts to wonder, I wonder what he looks like right now. So he 
dug him up, pulled him out from under the floorboards, washed him, like did the same thing, washed him, dressed him, all of these things, hung out with him for a while, put him in a chair. They sat there and watched TV together. And this repeated until his body was not in, not in a, a condition to continue this. So about eight months later, he took him out to the back garden that he had exclusive access to and burned, burned the body. He would cut the body into manageable sizes and then put it on a bonfire in the back garden, but cover it with things and also cover it with like a tire because when you burn a tire, it stinks real bad and it would cover up the smell of burning body. By the way, I am telling the story of the murders in order, but not necessarily the order that the bodies were discovered because that would be way too confusing. They're way out of order. About a year later, on December 3rd, 1979, Des befriended a 23 year old Canadian tourist that he had met in a West End pub. The guy's name was Kenneth Ockenden. They spent the day sightseeing together and then they ended up at Des's house after dinner and drinks. They were having such a great time. But then of course, you know, Des realizes that Ken's gonna leave soon. So what does he do? He strangles him with a headphone cable as they listen to records together. That evening, he slept with Kenneth's dead body next to him. And then he had a little photo shoot with him the next day. What is that? Des had gone out and bought a Polaroid camera. And then he went to town posing Kenneth's body and taking photos until he wrapped him in plastic and stuffed him under the floorboards. Like he didn't have the camera at the time. He had a dead body at his house and was like, hmm, photo shoot. And then went out and bought a camera. Anyways, so over the next two weeks, he would occasionally take Kenneth out, put him in a chair. They would watch TV, have drinks together. And he, you know, continued that, you know, just hiding, hiding the body under the floorboard, taking him out, hang out, put him back, yada, yada. Well, there had been about a year gap between the first and second victims, but that changed the following May. By this time, Des knew what he liked. He knew who to target. He knew how to lure these men back to his flat. This is when he started really ramping up the pace. So over this next year, he pretty much repeated this process almost every month. He did it nine more times. On May 17th, 1980, Des killed 16 year old Martin Duffy. He'd found him sleeping near a railway station as he was returning from a work conference. Des offered Martin a hot meal and a warm bed and then everything was fine until it wasn't. After Martin fell asleep, Des strangled him. Then he dragged him into the kitchen to drown him in the sink. Then he bathed his dead body, did things to it, did things to himself while standing over it. You know what I'm saying? Then he kept Martin's body inside a cupboard. I mean, I suppose he already knew what he was gonna do with it over the next couple of days and didn't wanna deal with the floorboards. It wasn't until Martin's body started to bloat from decomposition that he finally did move him to his preferred storage area. So Dennis Nilsson's victims all kind of varied in age, but they were all vulnerable targets, you know? And what I mean is that they were transient, some of them were sex workers. Some of them were addicts. Most of them were estranged from their families. They were people who were already missing so they wouldn't be missed. All right, like I said, that summer, Des really started ramping up his activities. And there were even a few failed encounters sprinkled in. Failed meaning that the would-be victim somehow got away. Also, not every successful encounter has the same amount of detail available, probably because there were so many. On August 20th, 1980, Des met 26 year old male sex worker named William Sutherland at Piccadilly Circus. He went home with Nilsson where he was strangled. In September, Des recalled killing a late twenties aged Irish laborer with rough hands. His identity was never revealed. In October, Des killed another young sex worker that was never identified, although he recalls that the lad was perhaps Filipino or Mexican. Now remember, he would kill these people and then put them in the floorboards. By the end of 1980, space was getting tight. So Des decided to free some up. He was a trained chef, remember? He knew how to break down a body. Des would take each corpse into the kitchen and dissect them. He would cut the organs into small pieces and then bag them up for disposal. He would usually just throw the bags over the back fence for wildlife to come get their snack on. 
he would bury the larger limbs in the torso pieces in the back garden or put them in bags out for the trash to get taken away. And he would put together a communal bonfire in the back garden to conceal any other extra pieces. Like I said, he would put that tire on top to conceal the smell. And then Des kind of repeated this little bonfire trick quite a few times, being sure to inspect the ashes the next day. He would go through the ashes and the debris um, after they'd cooled to see if he could recognize any bone fragments and then he would smash them. In November, Des found a homeless youth sleeping in a doorway, killed him, same thing. In December, Des took home a long-haired hippie type, you know, between the ages of 25 and 30. Killed him, obviously. He kept the body in the floorboards. He eventually cut it up into three pieces. Space was getting tight, so he had to get creative. He eventually did burn that body in the backyard about a year later. In early January of 1981, Des met an 18-year-old blue-eyed Scottish male who wore a green tracksuit and trainers. They met at the Golden Lion Pub in Soho. After they both enjoyed the evening's drinking contest at the bar, Des took him home and, you know, murdered him. In February, he met a young man from Belfast in his early 20s. Des strangled him with a necktie, as he did with most of his other victims, and then he put his body under the floorboards. In April 1981, Des started to spice things up, and he met a young English skinhead. Des lured him to his house with the promise of a hot meal, and after he killed the man, he hung up his naked torso in his bedroom for a day, and then he placed the body under the floorboards. But, you know, with this one, he later recanted the story to the police, saying that he just made it up. On September 18th, 1981, Des crossed paths with 23-year-old Malcolm Barlow. Now, Barlow was an orphan, and he also suffered from epilepsy. He had spent most of his life in intense care. He had suffered a seizure on the street, and Des had very kindly helped him out. He saw that he got medical attention. It was all very nice right? But Malcolm came back to Dez's apartment the next day to thank him for being so kind, and um, then Dez killed him. Definitely not kind. By this point, there was no more room in the floorboards, so Dez just kind of kept this guy in the cupboard in the kitchen. This was the last victim at the Melrose Avenue address. In mid-1981, Dennis's landlord let him know that he had planned to renovate specifically Dennis's apartment, and he, you know, pretty much gave him notice. Actually, he offered him a thousand pounds to break the lease and move out, and Des was like, okay. On October 5th, 1981, Des moved out of the Melrose Avenue address and moved into 23 Cranley Gardens in the Muswell Hill District of North London. So the new apartment did not have the private garden access that the other place did, and he couldn't just easily whip up a bonfire. And also, it was an attic apartment, so he couldn't put things in the floorboards because there wasn't room for that, you know? So he kind of put the brakes on the killing spree, but it did not last long. In March of 1982, Dennis met 23-year-old Josh Howlett at a local pub near Leicester Square, and then he took him back to his flat for more drinks. They drank heavily, and when Howlett nodded off, he woke up later to being strangled by Des. As he had done with many other victims, Des then held his head under water in the bathtub until he drowned. He dismembered Josh's body, put the large bones out with the rubbish, and then took all of the soft organs and flushed them down the toilet. In April 1982, a 21-year-old talented singer and drag performer named Carl Stotter was living in a nearby hostel. He met Nilsson at the Black Cap pub in Camden and agreed to go back to Dez's flat where he passed out drunk. And then he woke up to the zip of his sleeping bag tightening around his neck. He remembers hearing Dez whisper, he passed out and then woke up again, and Nilsson was trying to drown him in the bathtub. Imagine, Carl Stotter is on the bed, right? Nilsson has strangled him and drowned him in the bathtub, and then he notices that he's still alive. Then he revived him. Anyways, when Carl came to, he was very confused, disoriented, and Nilsson told him that he had gotten himself caught up in the zip of the sleeping bag because he was having a terrible nightmare. He put him in that cold water because he was in shock. 
Good one. Now, you guys, I don't care what anyone tells you, your sleeping bag will not attack you. It's not a thing that happens. Anyways, so after Des helped to revive Carl, he looked after him for a couple days to make sure that he was okay. And then he walked him to the tube station where he went straight to the hospital. It wasn't until Carl was questioned by police much later that he realized that the near-death encounter that he had with Nilsen was actually real and not just some kind of crazy dream he had. At any rate, that whole ordeal caused Carl to suffer permanent damage to his vocal cords and it derailed his singing prospects and the impact of the ordeal with Nielsen haunted him for the rest of his life. He changed his name to Cara Willis and struggled with alcoholism for really the rest of his life and he unfortunately passed away from complications of diabetes in 2013 at the age of 52. In September of 1982, Nielsen bumped into 27 year old tourist Graham Allen. He had gotten turned around, you know, and just sort of needed some directions. Well, Nielsen invited him back to his house for dinner and Graham was eating the omelet that Nilsen had prepared for him. Nilsen strangled him. He would later tell police that he had accidentally choked on that omelet, you know, but we see you. We see each other. We see each other. We good. Alan's body was actually left in the bathtub for a few days, like three days after Nilsen killed him. It wasn't until he could get a day off of work that he could dismember him, dispose of the, the body. That was also something he would do at the Cranley Gardens location. After he had killed somebody, he would need a little bit of time and privacy to take care of things. So he would just call in sick to work or take a day off of work so he could take care of business. All right, well, on January 6th, 1983, Nilsen met 20 year old heroin addict, Steven Sinclair. Nilsen had bought him a hamburger before he took him back to his home and strangled him. Well, Nilsen bathed him, powdered him and snuggled him and then later dismembered and disposed of his body. This specific murder is the one that got Nilsen charged with murder. Okay, so now we're caught back up to him being arrested and telling police that there was 14 or 15 victims. Okay, so the police had been called to Cranley Gardens because of that suspicious drain situation. The, the funny part is, Nilsen is the one who had made the complaint to the landlord about the clogged drains. Des. You're the one who clogged the drains with human organs, my dude. Anyways, the plumber, Michael Catron, had found the drain packed with some kind of fleshy substance. And when he examined the pipes leading to the drain, they, that pipe had gone straight up to Nilsen's attic flat. Okay, so now Dennis Nilsen is arrested. He's being interviewed by police. There was no question that he would refuse to answer. All the details that he could recall, he would just casually tell the story like he was describing the contents of a boxy charm. Haul the body out onto the floorboards, put it on the sheet, and then cut it out. He described every victim, he described what he did to him, how he did it, and in fact, he, he wouldn't stop talking. They quickly realized that this was the biggest case they'd ever seen. I mean, how could 16 people disappear and nobody notice? Was he lying? Once the police started really looking around Cranley Gardens, his apartment, they found the tools that he would use to kill and dismember his victims. Also, he would boil parts of the bodies, the hands and feet and head. So like anything that was maybe a little bit more difficult to butcher, he would just boil it and then dispose of whatever came off the bones and then crush the bones and get rid of them. But yeah, like everything else that he could, soft organs and little bits, it went right, it went in the toilet. The toilet! Police ended up finding more than a thousand teeth and bone fragments when they dug up that garden in the field behind the former house at Melrose. When they were searching the area, it wasn't just that they were finding a few bones here and there. It was like littered with fragments and teeth. Very much like those like pan for gold attractions that you see in an old west tourist trap. You know what I'm saying? I think, it's not gold. I think it actually would be a little bit. I don't know. Well, he was officially charged with six counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder based on the available evidence that the investigators were able to substantiate. And even after telling the investigators all of the gory details, Nilsen pled 
not guilty. He cited diminished responsibility based on mental defect, claiming that he didn't know why he committed the crimes. He hoped that the police would tell him instead. He said that he wanted the police to know that he wasn't a monster. He was just a man. Now, I, I feel like we've heard this story like a million times before, you know, murderers who target the vulnerable. Those, they choose to go after people that who are already gone so they won't be missed, you know. Well, there were also other men that were discovered, ones that had had encounters with Dez, but they had somehow escaped with their lives. The defense counsel used the testimony of two psychiatrists that determined that he lacked the mental capacity to intentionally commit murder. One doctor claimed that although Nelson was intellectually aware of his actions, he was not aware of their nature. The prosecution argued that Nilsson was a manipulative person capable of forming relationships and he chose to treat his victims as objects. He knew what he was doing. So at the conclusion of the trial, Dennis Nilsson was convicted at the Old Bailey of six counts of murder and two of attempted murder, sentenced to life imprisonment on November 4th, 1983, with the recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. That recommendation was later changed to a whole life tariff and in his later years he was imprisoned at full Sutton maximum security prison. Over the years many forensic psychologists have offered their opinions on the reason that Dennis Nilsson did what he did, specifically that the post-murder slumber parties, you know. They speculated about um, an instance where Dennis saw a childhood bully being pulled out of a fishing pond after a drowning, left some kind of defect on his mind about being infatuated with passive partners, feeling powerful over those who have literally no control. Some also speculated at the impact of seeing his grandpa at such a young age. I mean, just, there's so many things. So in 1985, Brian Masters' book, Killing for Company, was published, and it recounts the many interviews and conversations he had with Dennis Nilsson regarding his life, and it even includes some entries written by Nilsson himself. In 2006, modern DNA evidence testing was able to confirm the identity of Nilsson's first victim, that 14-year-old boy, Stephen Holmes. And of the 15 victims that Dennis Nelson has confessed to murdering, only eight have been positively identified. Dennis Nelson was 35 years into serving his life sentence when he underwent a stomach operation and he suffered a blood clot during that procedure where he later died on May 12th, 2018 at age 72. Well, that is the story of Dennis Nilsson, friends. As I was finishing up my research on this case, I discovered a new documentary on Netflix that I highly recommend that you check out if you're interested in this story. It's called Memories of a Murder, The Nilsson Tapes, and it's essentially a documentary about what happened and it features recordings made by Dennis Nilsson himself. So like I said before, this case is super, super famous and there's been many other people that have covered it. So I will link some of my favorites down in the description box. I really recommend that you check them out too. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials as well. If you're interested in other crew crime channels or any of the makeup that I'm wearing or my jewelry, any of that stuff, my nail polish color, it's all down in the description box. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Psychiatrist. Nope. Yikes on the floorboards. Come on. Sleeping near a rail, a ra why can't I say this word? <clears throat> Railway. Railway. Man, I can do everything else, but I cannot talk and do eyebrows at the same time. What is my deal? Hi.